Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. To our ambassadors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Heritage Foundation. With this week marking the 17th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the United States, there is no better reminder for Americans why NATO is so incredibly important to our security and that of our allies. We will never forget that soon after the attack, NATO invoked its mutual defense clause, Article 5, for the first time in the alliance's history. Our NATO allies immediately provided security support and resources to help patrol and secure America's airspace and waterways. For those of us who were living and working in Washington at that time, we will never forget. And since 2001, it has been in Afghanistan where America's allies in NATO have given and sacrificed considerably. For the past 17 years, tens of thousands of NATO troops have fought alongside US troops there. Since 2001, over a thousand of our NATO partners have made the ultimate sacrifice. The United States and NATO are partners in promoting democratic values around the world and working together to provide security and prosperity for our allies. We share these allies, with these allies, a strong commitment to the rule of law, human rights, economic freedom, and democracy. NATO is also an alliance that has created the conditions for economic prosperity in Europe. And thanks to the security and stability it has provided over the decades. This relationship provides untold benefits for the US economy and by extension, the American worker. For these reasons and others, it is my personal honor to welcome Secretary Jens Stoltenberg today. By the time he became NATO's 13th Secretary General in October 2014, Russia had just invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea only months before. ISIS had just taken Mosul and was on the march to Baghdad. And NATO was preparing to transition from a combat mission to a training mission in Afghanistan. Talk about hitting the ground running. But under his leadership, he's been able to guide the alliance through these challenging times. Under his watch, NATO members have increased their defense spending. The alliance's posture in Eastern Europe has been bolstered to counter Russian aggression. And a new NATO training mission in Iraq has been established as part of the global coalition to defeat ISIS. And there has been a renewed focus inside the alliance to face non-traditional threats like cybersecurity and hybrid warfare. Since its creation in 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization has done more to promote democracy and peace in Europe than any other organization and has served as one of our greatest allies. For this reason and many more, we look forward to the future and that NATO stays ready, resourced, and relevant. So please join me in welcoming the Secretary General, Jan Stolenberg. Thank you so much. So good morning to you all, and uh, let me start by thanking you, Ms. Jones, for this, uh, James, for this very um, generous uh, introduction, and also for having me here today, and to let me speak to this uh, audience. Uh, I would also like to thank the Heritage Foundation for the very important work you do, and for your steadfast support for over many years for the values that uh, NATO holds uh, so uh, uh, dear. Um, I will be quite brief in my introduction, uh, but then I will be more than happy to answer questions and, uh, and uh, respond to your comments uh, afterwards. 
Today I will uh, address uh, the issue of uh, why NATO is important, the value of NATO. Uh, NATO is important for Europe. That is widely recognized and uh, widely uh, understood. But NATO is also very important for the United States. And let me mention three reasons why NATO is important also for the United States. First, peace and stability in Europe are of vital uh, importance, vital interest uh, to the United States. Second, NATO allies share and support the fundamental values which are at the heart of uh, the American uh, society. And third, NATO allies boost America's military power. So first, NATO was, forced, was forged in the aftermath of two world wars which led to the loss of 90 million uh, lives and widespread economic devastation. When we consider NATO's uh, value today, we need to take into account the devastating loss of life and ruinous economic costs of a major war in Europe. For nearly 70 years, NATO has helped to preserve peace and stability in Europe. This has provided the foundation for an unprecedented period of prosperity for all NATO allies, including the United States. Europe and North America together represent half of the world's economic output. And while we now see uh, some disagreements over tariffs, it does not change the fact that Europe and North America are each other's biggest trading partners. So peace and stability in Europe are the foundation for continued prosperity on both sides of the Atlantic. Second, we share uh, fundamental uh, values that we protect and defend together. Democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. They are the foundations of our free societies. But they are also the foundations of our engagement with the rest of the world. These values are magnets for other countries and lead them to join our alliance. After the Berlin Wall came down, former Warsaw Pact countries and the Baltic states all joined NATO. And more countries aspire uh, to join, and many have already followed. NATO has helped to spread democratic values, free uh, enterprise, and stability to millions of people in uh, Europe. This represents a historic geopolitical shift that has benefited also the United States and the world at large. Third, the third reason why NATO is important for the United States is that NATO allies boost America's military power. They have nearly 2 million service personnel on active duty and cutting edge capabilities. France and the United Kingdom contribute 30% of NATO's nuclear ballistic missile submarine fleet. America's NATO uh, allies also maintain dual capable aircraft for nuclear delivery to enhance our deterrence and defense and keep peace. Furthermore, America's NATO allies employ tens of thousands of intelligence personnel, many of them working in close coordination with their US counterparts, giving the United States better eyes and better ears than you would otherwise have. From tracking submarines in the Arctic to identifying terrorists that seek to harm us. NATO allies in Europe host 28 American main operating bases across Europe. These bases in Europe are not only for Europe. They enable US to project power, military power, across 
the wider Middle East and Africa, providing a clear strategic advantage in the fight against terrorism and other threats. For example, the US Africa Command is based not in Africa, but in Stuttgart, Germany. The Sixth Fleet, which operates from the Barents Sea to Antarctica, is headquartered in Naples, Italy. And when US troops are wounded in places like Iraq or Afghanistan, they are flown to quick uh, treatment to Rammstein in Germany. When thinking of the value of NATO to the United States, I'm also reminded of what Secretary Mattis once told me, that never in his entire career had he fought a war without NATO allies at his side. The US never has to fight alone. This week we marked the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks uh, on the United States. After those attacks, NATO invoked our Collective Defense Clause, Article 5, for the first and only time. Since then, thousands, hundreds of thousands, of European and Canadian soldiers have fought alongside the United States in Afghanistan. And more than a thousand have paid the ultimate price. And also today, NATO allies continue to stand with the United States not only in Afghanistan, but also in the global coalition against ISIS, and in deterring an increasingly assertive Russia. For nearly seven decades, the United States has been able to call upon its allies, its close allies and friends in NATO. No other power can do that. No other power in the world has so many friends and so many allies as the United States. So NATO supports the prosperity, the values, and the security of the United States. But it is clear that allies need to invest more and better in our shared security. All NATO allies have agreed to stop cuts to defense budgets, to increase spending, and to move spending 2% of GDP on defense by 2024. We are making real progress. Last year, NATO allies across Europe and Canada boosted the defense budgets by a combine of 5.2% in real terms. The biggest increase in a quarter of a century. This year will be the fourth consecutive year of rising defense spending. The trend was down, now the trend is up. But we still have a long way to go. And let there be no mistake, NATO's credibility as an alliance relies on sharing costs of defense fairly. As you know, President Trump has been outspoken on this issue. And I have thanked him for his leadership on defense spending. Since President Trump took office, NATO allies across Europe and Canada have spent an additional 41 billion extra US dollars on defense. At our July summit, all NATO allies agreed to redouble their efforts on defense spending. This will be a main focus of the Defense Ministers' meeting in NATO next month. And we will continue to work intensively with all allies to ensure that we deliver on our pledge. In an uncertain world, we have much more to do as we work together to safeguard the freedom and security of our nearly 1 billion citizens on both sides of the Atlantic. Yes, we have our differences and robust debates. But two world wars and the Cold War and the ongoing fight against terrorism have taught us 
that we are far stronger together than apart. We have always been united in our core collective defense mission. That is why NATO is the most successful and the most valuable alliance in history. Because it, in, it embodies the vital transatlantic bond. A bond that guarantees our prosperity, our security, and our freedom in Europe and in North America. Thank you so much. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for that. It was a comprehensive view of uh, how important NATO is to the United States and how important uh, the United States is to NATO. And it's uh, the fact that they're mutually beneficial is the key to its success all these years. We have spent uh, decades here at the Heritage Foundation talking about the importance of European security in NATO, and we're just very privileged and very honored to have you here today to, to address all of this. We have a lot of uh, people in the audience that are eager to uh, ask you some questions, but I think I will take the, the privilege of being here with you to ask the first one. Uh, and that's to ask you about uh, the Arctic. Uh, Russia is uh, clearly demilitarizing the Arctic. Uh, they're building some new bases. Some old bases have been uh, reopened. Uh, and yet, uh, there's not a lot of at least official talk, I should say, in the concept of the strategic concept of NATO about the Arctic. You come from a country that very close to the Arctic. Uh, we'd be very interested in what you think, uh, how NATO should be thinking about Arctic security. Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, the Arctic is extremely important, and, um, and uh, we see, as you said, uh, increased Russian presence uh, with uh, modern military capabilities in the uh, Arctic. And uh, that's also one of the reasons why uh, NATO is adapting our military posture, uh, not only the Arctic, but, uh, as I say, in general. Uh, but that also has some consequences for the Arctic. We are, uh, for instance, uh, strengthening our uh, maritime posture, uh, investing more in uh, naval capabilities. Um, we have just agreed to establish a new Atlant Atlantic Command with uh, headquarters in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and that will address also some of the challenges uh, in the Arctic. Um, and uh, we are uh, also doing more when it comes uh, to um, improving uh, surveillance, reconnaissance. I know that uh, countries uh, close to the Arctic, or at least close to the border in the North Atlantic, like uh, Norway, you mentioned, Denmark, uh, UK, are investing in more modern uh, capabilities, which can address the challenges we also see in the high north. You are right that I'm coming from a country which is uh, close to the Arctic, actually more than that. Uh, half of Norway is in the Arctic. Um, uh, uh, so you have to remember that the Arctic is not only the North Pole. The Arctic is everything north of the polar or the Arctic Circle, uh, which is, for instance, half of Norway. Uh, so what we do, for instance, in northern Norway uh, or in Greenland or in the North Atlantic is also uh, extremely important for the Arctic. Having said all this, I would like to highlight the following, is that we used to say that we have uh, low tensions in the high north. And I still believe it is important to try to keep tensions down in the high north. And the reality is that uh, partly because this is a, a very vulnerable area for also environmental reasons, um, we are also working together with Russia uh, addressing some of the challenges in the high north. It's something called the Arctic Council. Uh, several NATO allies are a member of the Arctic Council. Uh, Russia is member. We work together, when, together with them on search, rescue, uh, environmental cooperation, and managing big fish stocks up there. And uh, I believe that uh, there is no contradiction between being so strong, present, uh, but at the same time see the potential for uh, cooperation uh, in the high uh, north. Thank you. Now we'll open it up to the audience. If I could just ask uh, you to uh, raise your hand. We have... Um, 
people with microphones, if you could just wait to get the microphone. Identify yourself very briefly, and if you could keep the questions brief, we really appreciate that uh, because we only have so much time here. So let's, uh, let's get started. Luke, you want to get us started? My name is Luke Coffey. I'm the director of the Foreign Policy Center here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, thank you, Secretary General Stoltenberg, for your great uh, defense of the importance of NATO to the U.S. and to the alliance as a whole in the 21st century. Uh, British parliamentarian and chairman of the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee, Tom Tugendhat, recently proposed this, uh, what I think is a great idea, to name the uh, new NATO headquarters after Senator John McCain. And I think that there would be bipartisan support on this side of the Atlantic, and there were some positive signals from the other side of the Atlantic on this idea. So I was wondering if you could um, tell us what you thought about this proposal personally, and if NATO as an alliance is actively considering this great idea. Thank you. <laughs> NATO allies, and uh, I personally very much respect uh, uh, late Senator John McCain uh, for many reasons, but not least because of his uh, very strong support and commitment to NATO, to the transatlantic bond. He traveled often to NATO allied countries in Europe. Uh, I met him many times in Brussels, in Munich, uh, and elsewhere, and also, of course, in Washington. And he has a lifelong career in support of NATO and uh, the values that NATO uh, defense. Uh, I also had the honor of uh, participating in the uh, funeral of uh, uh, Senator McCain uh, a couple of weeks ago here in Washington, and I know that uh, all allies uh, respect him very much and honor his uh, memory. Uh, NATO doesn't have a tradition of naming buildings after uh, politicians. Um, you know, we are 29 allies with a lot of presidents, kings, uh, heads of state and government, so uh, we haven't uh, in introduced that uh, tradition. So I'm certain that we were, will be able to honor John McCain, uh, but not necessarily through uh, naming a building. Uh, and actually, we honor John McCain every day uh, through uh, the fact that we stand together in NATO and deliver a strong transatlantic uh, deterrence and defense. Thank you, Secretary General. Jeff Rathke from the American Institute of Contemporary German Studies. Two questions, if I could. Uh, the, often we hear criticism from Washington about the contributions that Germany makes to the alliance, in particular its level of defense spending. Um, I'd be interested in your comments on how you see the trends in Germany um, and what issues you prioritize in your dialogue with Germany, and also whether you think there's any grounds for fear that um, uh, NATO allies in the East might provoke a conflict with Russia. First, uh, on, uh, on whether NATO allies will provoke a conflict with Russia, uh, we will not. NATO is a defensive alliance. Uh, NATO has proven that for many, many decades. And uh, the increased presence of NATO troops in the eastern part of the alliance is uh, a defensive response, a pro proportionate response uh, uh, to what we have seen uh, Russia being responsible for uh, in Ukraine, Crimea, so illegally annexing Crimea, uh, uh, destabilizing eastern Ukraine, uh, and, uh, and therefore uh, uh, yeah, NATO is and will be, uh, remain a, a defensive alliance. And that's the case for all allies. Um, um, when it, when it comes to Germany, we all agree, also Germany, that Germany has to invest more in defense. Um, so uh, that's, uh, uh, that's something we agreed at the uh, NATO summit in July. Uh, we have uh, stated that also before. Uh, and uh, Germany has started to increase defense spending. And they have actually put forward a plan to increase defense spending by 70%. Uh, 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 over a decade, which is significant, and this is money which will be helpful uh, to modernize uh, their armed forces, to buy new uh, uh, modern uh, equipment, 
um, and they have started this uh, uh, build up. I welcome that because what Germany does really matters because the German economy is so big. Uh, so when they start to move, it also affects the total defense spending uh, of uh, NATO. Uh, burden sharing within the alliance is of course very much about defense spending, but it's also about what we call contributions and capabilities. And uh, Germany is contributing, for instance, to the NATO presence in Afghanistan the second largest force contributor to our mission there. And uh, they are responsible for the northern part of Afghanistan, and one of the lead nations or framework nations. And Germany is also contributing to all the NATO missions and operations in Kosovo, but also, for instance, being a lead nation for one of our battle groups, the one we have in, in, in Lithuania. So the short answer is that, yes, uh, Germany should do more, but Germany agrees, and they have started to invest more in defense. Other questions? Here in the middle. Thank you very much. My name is David Nikoradze. I represent Georgian television station Rusa between Washington, D.C. Secretary General, I wonder if there is any update uh, about NATO enlargement and Georgia's possible membership. <laughs> Thanks. We had a very good meeting uh, with uh, the Georgian president uh, in Brussels during the uh, summit. I uh, met with uh, President Magrashvili and uh, we uh, uh, addressed uh, the importance of strengthening the partnership between uh, NATO and Georgia. Um, uh, NATO strongly supports the uh, sovereignty, the territorial integrity of, uh, uh, of Georgia. And of course, we don't uh, in any way uh, recognize uh, the, the presence of uh, Russian forces uh, in parts of uh, uh, Georgia. Uh, we also reiterated at the summit in July, NATO heads of state and government, that Georgia will become a member of NATO. Uh, we uh, help Georgia uh, with implementing reforms. We provide political support, practical support. We have established a training center, uh, training and evaluation center in Georgia and we help uh, with uh, implementing uh, reforms of defense and security institutions. So Georgia is making progress. We welcome that. Uh, we will continue to uh, support Georgia uh, and help Georgia as it moves towards uh, closer EU Atlantic integration, including uh, towards membership in uh, NATO. Let me also add that we are extremely grateful for what Georgia does for NATO. Uh, Georgia participate in NATO exercises, uh, contribute to our uh, NATO response force, uh, but not least, Georgia is one of the main uh, partners uh, uh, sending troops, conti contributing with troops to, uh, to our mission in Afghanistan. So uh, Georgia is important for NATO, and NATO is important for Georgia, and we uh, continue to strengthen our partnership. Mr. Secretary, let me uh, shift the topic a little bit. You know, you're talking about what NATO is doing and how important it is to our mutual security, but let me shift the question to public diplomacy and public support for NATO, both here and in Europe. It's been over 30 years since the Cold War ended. Uh, the challenges today from Russia are somewhat, on the one hand they're similar, on the other hand they're entirely different. Uh, many younger people who are not alive during the Cold War are being asked to uh, support and even participate in some cases in military operations on behalf of NATO. Uh, can you say a few words about how we need to uh, go beyond sort of making the case, if you will, to states and, and politicians and experts to the public at large about how important NATO is to the security, particularly for, for younger people? Of course, we can never take the support for NATO for given, and, uh, and, uh, and new generations who, have not, uh, who don't remember, who have never experienced the war, of course, uh, it's a different thing for them. Uh, 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 but, uh, uh, but having said that, I think the good news is that when we look at the opinion polls, it's actually strong support for NATO, uh, not, uh, especially in the United States. And the support for NATO has increased uh, I can't remember, 60-something percent. So it's a strong 
support for NATO in the United States as it is in European allied countries. And uh, according to the latest figures from the Pew uh, uh, Research Institute, uh, the, the support has uh, at a historic high uh, level. Um, uh, so we, the, the challenge is in a way to maintain that high uh, and bipartisan support for uh, NATO. I think that's uh, partly about showing that NATO is important both when it comes to collective defense in Europe, deterring uh, Russia and any other potential adversaries, uh, uh, adversary from attacking any NATO allied country, but is also showing that NATO is able to respond to some of the new uh, threats and challenges uh, in cyber, uh, hybrid, and therefore NATO is uh, modernizing its hybrid capabilities, cyber, uh, cyber capabilities and, and, and responses to hybrid threats. And, uh, of course, uh, in the fight against terrorism. The fight against terrorism is not a completely new challenge. It has been there for many years. But NATO is playing a key role, uh, both in our presence in Afghanistan. We have to remember that the reason why we are in Afghanistan is to prevent Afghanistan ever again become a safe haven for international terrorists. And there are many problems in Afghanistan, but at least we have uh, prevented Afghanistan from once again becoming a platform for launching terrorist attacks against our own uh, countries. Now we are also starting training mission in Iraq. So NATO is able to respond to many different challenges. Uh, let me add one more, and that's, for instance, the migrant and, and, and refugee crisis in, uh, in, in Europe. And NATO is also helping to respond to that with our presence in the Aegean Sea, where we help to, to implement the agreement between Turkey and, uh, and EU uh, 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 on, on stopping the flow of illegal migration over the GNC. All right, let's go over this way. Hey, Therese Ali, uh, I cover the Pentagon for Reuters. Um, the Russian disinformation sort of idea is nothing new, but it's gained attention after the 2016 elections here. Um, could you sort of talk about the Russia disinformation campaign and how that's developed over the past few years and specifically how you see uh, sort of Russia using disinformation um, in Macedonia ahead of their referendum uh, later this month? As we have seen uh, many examples and we have uh, seen many reports about how Russia tried to meddle uh, in uh, our democratic political processes in different uh, NATO countries and in uh, partner uh, countries of uh, NATO. Uh, also by, uh, uh, also through disinformation, using social media, uh, and uh, so on. And we also seen that in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, which is now uh, close to, as which will have a referendum uh, the 30th of September uh, on a name deal. Uh, and if they agree to that deal, they can become a member of uh, NATO. Uh, we also seen Russia, for instance, trying to uh, not only prevent uh, f the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia to become a member of NATO, but also try to uh, prevent uh, Montenegro from becoming a member. Uh, they, they, we have seen um, a failed coup attempt uh, there. And we have seen they're using media and social media uh, disinformation to try to influence uh, political processes in different European and NATO allied countries. Um, NATO is responding to this in many different ways. Um, this is partly about cyber um, some defense. Uh, uh, it's partly about uh, responding to disinformation and propaganda. Uh, and I think that uh, the best way to respond to propaganda is not uh, with propaganda. But the best way to uh, respond to disinformation and propaganda is to provide the facts, the truth truth will prevail. And uh, therefore, what we try to do is provide the facts. Uh, NATO as an alliance can do so. The headquarters, uh, we have some center of excellence uh, on these issues. But of course, also the different member states have a particular responsibility to respond, to be aware, uh, and, uh, and to uh, see the dangers of uh, Russia trying to meddle in domestic political uh, processes. Um, I also strongly believe that a free and independent media is extremely important in responding to any attempt to spread disinformation uh, and propaganda. So uh, free independent media uh, that is able to 
uh, ask the difficult question, to be critical, to check their sources, uh, is also uh, extremely important uh, to uh, establish resilience against any outside attempt to, uh, to meddle in our political processes. Hi, I'm Amanda Macias. I cover the Pentagon for CNBC. I'm wondering if you could discuss the unique situation Turkey is in with their desire to buy the Russian missile system S-400 and also wanting to buy the F-35. Um, can you talk about those two big ticket items and how they conflict with each other? It is a challenge and it is well known that uh, there is a disagreement between uh, Turkey and especially the United States on this uh, issue. Um, uh, decisions on uh, 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 acquisition of uh, military capabilities is, uh, is, a, uh, is a national decision. Uh, but what is important for NATO is, of course, interoperability, that the different systems can work together. Uh, and I have discussed this many times uh, in Ankara, also discussed it in Washington. Uh, and uh, and uh, 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 I hope that it's possible to find a solution. Uh, because uh, what we see now is a challenge for all of us that uh, uh, that uh, there is this uh, disagreement uh, on the issue of uh, uh, S-400, the Russian uh, air defense system, which Turkey has decided to buy, and uh, uh, also the decision, and actually Turkey being part of the F-35 uh, program. Um, so, um, and I also welcome the fact that, the, that, that there is a direct bilateral dialogue between Turkey and, uh, uh, and the United States on this issue. Uh, and, uh, and also the fact that NATO has been a kind of platform for, for this dialogue. I know that this was an issue that was addressed, for instance, during the summit uh, in July uh, in NATO. Let me add then one more thing, and that is that Turkey is a very important ally for NATO for many reasons, but not least because of its geographic location. If you look at the map, you see how big Turkey is, but also how Turkey is bordering uh, Iraq, Syria, and uh, you will understand why Turkey has been so important in the fight against ISIS Daesh. Infrastructure bases, air, uh, uh, air bases has, have been extremely important in the uh, success we have had in degrading and uh, fighting ISIS. Um, uh, Turkey is also important when it comes to dealing with the migrants and refugee crisis. They host millions of refugees and they are important to implement an agreement between EU, EU and Turkey uh, on uh, managing the flow of migrants of the Aegean Sea. Turkey is also the ally which has suffered uh, uh, without a comparison, most terrorist attacks. Um, uh, and uh, it's important that we understand uh, that uh, this is something which really is appalling to see the high number of terrorist attacks in uh, Turkey, and they also suffered a failed coup attempt. So yes, there is a problem, there is a challenge uh, with uh, the decision to by S-400 combined with the F-35. I welcome the dialogue. This is addressed, uh, but at the same time, it is important to recognize the importance that Turkey is playing to the whole uh, alliance. Hi, uh, Courtney McBride with Wall Street Journal. Thank you for doing this. Um, you've discussed contributions and capabilities a little bit, but are you concerned that some of the public discussion of NATO, particularly with respect to burden sharing, has been framed in financial terms? Um, and sort of how do you counter that narrative? And then separately, if you could give us your thoughts on PESCO and just how that relates to NATO, whether that is uh, potentially a risk that member states may reorganize their priorities and, and perhaps to the detriment of, of NATO. So burden sharing within NATO is not only about uh, spending, it is also about, as I said, contributions. So European allies sending troops to Afghanistan, uh, European allies uh, being responsible for some of our battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance, uh, 
uh, and capabilities, also different uh, weapon systems and so on. But burden sharing is also about money. It's also about spending. So if you, by financial terms, mean spending, I am not concerned about the fact that we are also discussing spending in NATO. Actually, I am <laughs> raising that issue in all my meetings. Uh, because NATO allies have to invest more in defense. Uh, all NATO allies uh, reduced defense spending after the end of the Cold War, because then tensions went down. I have told uh, many audiences like this before that in the 1990s I was Minister of Finance in Norway, and then I was responsible for cutting defense spending in Norway. So I don't know exactly how to do that. Uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and that was, in a way, the, the natural thing to do, because when tensions went down, uh, uh, then, then it's right to reduce spending, as long as we are able to increase defense spending when tensions are going up. And therefore, later on, as Prime Minister of Norway, I was also responsible for starting to increase defense spending. And therefore, I also call on all allies to invest more. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, during the Cold War, most allies spent 3% of GDP on defense. Uh, now we call on them to spend uh, 2 um, The good news is that they have really started to move. Uh, when we made the decision back in 2014, it was only three allies that spent 2% of GDP on defense. This year, we expect eight allies to spend 2% of GDP on defense. And, 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 and also those who spend less have really started to increase. Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, last year we had 5.2% real increase in defense spending across Europe and Canada, the biggest increase since the end of the Cold War. And, uh, and uh, since, uh, uh, since Trump became uh, president, uh, 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 NATO allies, uh, European NATO allies and Canada have increased defense spending by uh, 41 billion <coughs> US dollars. So we are really going in the right direction. Uh, we are pushing for more. Uh, but we are, uh, we have seen a significant uh, uh, shift. Uh, I don't know whether I answered the questions, uh, but I at least uh, addressed the issue of spending. Uh, PESCO, uh, which is this structured uh, cooperation within the European Union on defense. I welcome stronger uh, uh, EU efforts uh, on defense <coughs> because I believe that that can contribute to fair burden sharing. It can develop uh, military capabilities in Europe, uh, and uh, uh, it can also address the fragmentation of the Euron European defense industry, which actually adds to the cost of developing new capabilities in Europe. I support this as long as this is not uh, developed into an alternative to NATO. As long as this is uh, complementary to NATO, we should welcome EU efforts on defense. It has been clearly stated from European leaders, from the EU, that this is not about duplicating NATO, this is not about creating an alternative to NATO, but this is about strengthening the European pillar within NATO. And as long as that's the case, we should welcome it. Because we need more uh, European capabilities, we need more European cooperation on defense. Uh, for instance, the US has one, main, one type of main battle tank. Uh, in Europe, they have seven. So it is much more, it is much, less, much less economy of scale, uh, much more costly. So if the European PESCO cooperation uh, can address the fragmentation of the European defense industry, that will actually be good for all of us. But European EU efforts on defense can never replace NATO. Uh, partly because if you look at the facts and the figures, when UK leaves <coughs> EU, 80%, 80% of NATO's defense expenditures will come from non-EU allies. So, so that's no way that can replace NATO. And uh, this is not only about money, but also about geography. Because if you look at geography, you have in the north, you have Norway, Iceland, uh, North Atlantic. In the south, you have Turkey and some other allies. And in the west, you have Canada, uh, United States, and UK. And of course, any credible defense of Europe needs those capabilities and also the geography of these uh, allies to uh, be effective in defending uh, uh, Europe. So 
Yes, I believe in stronger European defence. Uh, I believe in stronger EU efforts on defence, but uh, not as an alternative, but something which is complementing NATO. Last time the uh, NATO strategic concept was published was in 2010, and there's a lot that's happened since then. There's been the invasion of Ukraine, Arab Spring, uh, the migrant crisis, <coughs> and the Russian intervention in Syria. Uh, is it time to update the strategic concept? Some uh, some argue in favor of that, and uh, I, I uh, uh, so some some um, some people like to do that. Uh, I think that uh, it's not a must to do so, as long as we have as long as we are able to adapt our strategy and adapt NATO to a changing world, and that's exactly what we have done. So yes, we have not a new strategic concept, <laughs> but we have a new strategy. Uh, meaning that that we are we are actually we are actually we have actually proven that we have changed NATO fundamentally, because we have implemented the biggest adaptation of NATO since the end of the Cold War. Uh, for the first time in NATO's history, we have battle groups, combat re ready troops in the eastern part of the lines, four battle groups uh, in the three Baltic countries and Poland. We have tripled the size of the NATO response force, the, the high readiness force we have. Uh, we have just agreed to a new readiness initiative with uh, 30 battalions, 30 battleships, 30 air squadrons ready uh, to move uh, within 30 days or less. Uh, we have stepped up our fight against terrorism and we are doing much more when it comes to cyber and hybrid and so on. So as long as NATO is able to change in, uh, but through what we do on actions on the ground, uh, I'm not saying that the strategic concept it's not important, but I'm saying that actions are actually the most important thing, and we have been able to adapt to NATO. We have time for uh, one more question. Let's see if I can go over here. Well, there's some very hands in the corner back there. Hello, sir. My name is Grzegorz Kędzia. I am student of Daniel Morgan Graduate School of National Security. I've got for you a question connected with uh, Eastern flank. Uh, last week, Estonian counterintelligence arrested two men uh, for espionage for Russia. One of them was a uh, major in Estonian army headquarters. Uh, could you, sir, tell us anything uh, about damages caused by that espionage activity? Thank you. Um. What we have seen is a more assertive Russia, uh, a Russia which <coughs> has invested in many different types of capabilities, uh, also in intelligence. But I will not comment on intelligence. Uh, that will be that will be just undermine what NATO is doing and NATO allies are doing when they, in the area of intelligence. But what I can say is that uh, because we see a more assertive Russia. Uh, investing in modern capabilities, uh, modernizing the armed forces, exercising like we, in much bigger uh, form formations as we, uh, for instance, now see in, uh, in the ongoing Russian exercise in the Far East, and not least because Russia has been willing to use military force against neighbors in Georgia and Ukraine, uh, that's the reason why NATO has implemented the biggest reinforcement to our collective defense. Uh, and, that, and that's the reason why NATO allies have started to invest more for the first time since the end of the Cold War. NATO is not mirroring tank by tank or plane by plane what Russia is doing, but we are responding when we see that uh, the security challenges are changing with a more assertive uh, uh, Russia. Then I would like to underline that <coughs> Russia is there to stay. Russia is our neighbor, and, and NATO is not seeking confrontation with Russia. But for us, there is no contradiction between being firm, strong in our approach to Russia, as we are, but at the same time seeking uh, dialogue and try to reduce tensions with Russia. Because Russia will not go away. Russia will remain our biggest neighbor. And I know very well as a Norwegian politician uh, coming from Norway, 
a small country bordering Russia, but it is possible to have a firm, predictable uh, approach to Russia, but at the same time work for dialogue with Russia. Even during the coldest period of the Cold War, small Norway was able to have a working relationship with Russia on defense and security issues. Our military speak regularly with the Russian military up in the north. Uh, on energy, environment, we agree the borderline. Uh, but that was not despite NATO, despite uh, Norway's <coughs> membership in NATO, but, we, but it was because of NATO's membership in NATO, because that NATO membership provided the strength and the platform to engage with Russia. So I say this because we will all be losers if we move into new Cold War, a new arms race. Uh, so we have always to find that balance between being firm, predictable, uh, delivering credible deterrence and defense, but at the same time trying to develop a better relationship with Russia, including arms control uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, political dialogue with Russia. And that's exactly what NATO is doing. Mr. Secretary, we run out of time. We thank you very much for your time, for coming here to the Heritage Foundation. We know it's, it's personally your first visit here, uh, but we hope to see you again in the future. Maybe we can make this a regular event, uh, an annual report to the Heritage Foundation on the state of NATO. But we really appreciate your speech. We appreciate the time you've, you've uh, spent with the audience here. It's been a very in-depth analysis uh, you've, uh, and a comprehensive review of what's going on. So please, everyone, Join me in a round of applause for the Secretary of